Hello. Hello, and welcome to the 17th edition of the Techno Crime Fighter Forum. This is where we have a panel of targeted individuals who are also, by now, experts on what's going on in the field uh, to discuss the, what, they've, uh, what they've accomplished, what they've solved, what they've investigated this past week, and to bring everybody up to date on where we are. Um, also, I want to tell you that uh, we've had some complaints about the sound. We don't have anything to do with the sound. None of us do. It's all going through Google Hangouts, and uh, they seem to censor us in their own little kind of way. So uh, just put up with it. You might have to adjust the sound up and down a little bit. But I found that these forums are so chock full of information that they're well worth it. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to keep my microphone muted most of this. Uh, we have some um, alterations, modifications being done to the Hacienda Beyond Belief here. And uh, there's going to be delaying. And of course, as always, barking. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, truth about military intelligence. And I can't wait to get into this topic. Uh, uh, my two panelists who have who, who are here, uh, Catherine Horton and also uh, Ramola D, are loaded for bear on this topic. So I know we're going to have a rousing discussion. And also, we're going to, uh, in the second hour, uh, Karen's going to take us into some clips of other information that she has. Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry. Catherine is going to take us into those clips. So without further ado, uh, Catherine, would you like to uh, start us off with the truth about military intelligence? Yes, I, I quite fittingly today, you know, now that we talk about the military, I'm actually reporting from a military bunker. Um, I will just show um, what a military bunker in the 21st century looks like when your intelligence agency is in deep capture and uses electromagnetic machine guns to shoot at you. That's the first truth about the military. So um, it's going to be a bit jittery, but I want to show you how my office looks like. So imagine you have a room which you entirely had to cover in aluminium because you're being shot at on all sides. And then you have to, within that, make a cubicle of an extra layer of mylar because they shoot at you even within that. So I couldn't actually use my office properly for quite some time. And um, I'm now reporting from this bunker um, in Zurich. We're not talking some actual official war zone. This is the unofficial war zone of Zurich, Switzerland, where the intelligence agency, like everywhere else in the Western world, has gone properly criminal and is um, against the Geneva Conventions, is using military technology and military weapons to shoot at civilians. So this is the, the truth about the military is that they are a bunch of criminals and psychopaths. That's what I would like to open the floor with. And the evidence is that I have to bunker myself in in my own study, and I had to for the last um, year and a half that I've been physically assaulted. Uh, before that, I was also assaulted in Germany from a military helicopter. Um, I was also assaulted in my private flat. And all this, for the people who don't know, is being done with electromagnetic weapons or microwave weapons. And um, so for the people who are new to the series, a very short, um, the military is using something that's called non-lethal weapons. And that's an arsenal of totally lethal weapons. They mutilate and they kill, but they kind of um, did a bit of PR around it because they're, they are the most powerful weapons mm -hmm. and the best things we ever had um, you know, developed for committing the perfect crime. And that's why the military has to somehow circumvent the Geneva Conventions, because these weapons are totally against the Geneva Conventions, by the way. Um, and to circumvent that, they tone them down. And even though they are uber lethal weapons, they call them non-lethal weapons in the official double speak of the military that we'll see um, over and over today. And um, for the people who don't know, um, you have to imagine that the simplest electromagnetic weapon that you can build also yourself um, is a microwave weapon by just using your microwave and taking off the cladding and putting a little emitter 
inside your microwave you know in in a funnel and then you have a little microwave weapon so you can imagine you can cook meat in your microwave um, and therefore you can also use um you know your your standard microwave to kill somebody you can cook their you know their tissue you can give them a heart attack you can give them a stroke brain bleeding organ damage anything that you like and most tellingly you can do it through a wall and that uses the fact that um you know the reason why your microwave is entirely surrounded in metal is because only metal reflects these um frequencies but brick and concrete do not they are almost transparent to these frequencies so if you hold a microwave emitter up against a wall, you can kill somebody on the other side. And that shows you the power. And, and if you think about the cost of your microwave, mine cost literally 20 euros. So for 20 euros, you can get a lethal weapon. And with a bit of DIY, you can already turn it into, into such. And um, the military, of course, has bigger funds and they have all sorts of fancy weapons. And what they're using against me in particular um, by the way, I should um, I should find a link, you know, because right, I forgot to find this one link. But on YouTube, you can already find teenagers um, who have uploaded DIY videos of how to do how to make your own microwave weapon. So imagine we've got teenagers, you know, having detailed instructions and and live demonstrations of how they use these things to cook bacon, you know, online, and at the same time we have the police still pretending like these weapons don't exist and they try to section everybody who even dares to say i was attacked with a microwave weapon but to give you an idea of the power of these weapons so all you need to know is that 50 percent of um of the intensity goes through the wall you know um so any standard brick and concrete wall and this is why we have such excellent mobile phone reception mostly in buildings you know even if you are in an internal room somewhere in a building you still have mobile phone reception in most cases because the, the signals will just travel through the walls believe it or not um but what the military has developed and is using on me is what i call an, an electromagnetic machine gun and that is firing shots uh, so it's these microwave um, the microwave energy bundled into a pulse and then these pulses are fired every couple of seconds or continuously. So they can, you know, with a machine, they can drum you with a load or they can just um, send individual pulses. And um, there's literally no way to protect yourself against this. Normally, when you're inside a building, you can be machine gunned by these insane maniacs inside your own home. And that's what exactly what they do with civilians, as it seems these days. Um, and the only way to really protect yourself is to use metal because metal reflects. And um, as far as I can tell from the bruises and the injuries I have and from the sensation of intense pain, um, the beam um, and the pulse size from these electromagnetic machine guns is roughly the size of uh, maybe the tip of a pencil like, like this, the tip of this, this pen here. You know, depending on what they do, sometimes the more intense beams where they really bruise me up, it's like the size of a coin. Mm -hmm. but when they just fire shots it seems to be like the the tip of this thing or maybe even smaller and uh something that both i if both i and ramola but also karen um melton stewart and melanie richard have experienced is that if you surround yourself with metal if you either take you know the a cooking pan and you hold it up into the um line of attack or you use aluminium foil and that's behind here i've got thick aluminium foil and then a layer of mylar so mylar has a very thin aluminium coating as well, but that's what this layer is. Um, but if you use any kind of metal, you can actually hear the shots bounce off. Now, as a physicist, I cannot tell you how much energy you need to put into a pulse to generate a sound. Um, but I made a video recording um, that can be found on my YouTube video. Uh, where it's, you cannot just hear the sound as I'm being attacked. I'm also trying to protect my head and my shoulders because I'm being machine gunned. Uh, and you can see a shot putting a dent into aluminium. So, you know, I cannot describe you how intense these things are, but they are massively powerful. And I don't have to tell you that when you get a shot like that, um, what's so nasty is that it will go through you, like it goes through the wall, it goes through you, but it will deposit the energy in deeper layers. So inside your body, because it's mostly water, it will cook tissue, 
And one of the things that I heard several times is cavitation popping. So cavitation is when a very small area of your body, um, the, the water and the cells cooks or little bubbles form because of the superheating. And then the bubbles form, uh, accumulate air, and then they collapse again. And when they collapse, the kind of simultaneous pressure wave, you know, um, bounces off each other and there's an even bigger pressure wave, you know, from the kind of uh, the crashing together of two pressure waves that, you know, is projected out and that pressure wave pressure wave rips through your tissue. And then eventually you can hear it make a popping sound inside your body. So victims like me can hear these popping sounds inside the body. You feel it and sometimes you hear it maybe in your stomach where there's a lot of water, but I can also hear it in my head. And depending on where the shock wave is, you know, it reaches your ears at different times. So you can literally hear, is it on the right side, the left side, up and down, like you can hear normally. So that these are the horrors of these weapons. They dare to call non-lethal. They are maximally lethal. Every single shot is ripping through your tissue, is causing horrific injuries, but it's internal. So it's accumulate, accumulative internal damage. Mm -hmm. And I think that point that you're making, Catherine, about how deadly these weapons are, and yes, they're called non-lethal, is actually a very important point to make. Because what's happened currently now, right now, at this moment in time, with militaries around the world, is that they have simply gravitated to electronic weapons. You know, they have a whole um, section of their armies and militaries devoted, and air forces, of course, oh, and the Navy, let's not forget the Navy, uh, devoted to electromagnetic weapons. And, and, you know, a wide range, as you say. They are spectrum weapons, they are sonic weapons, they are sonar, radar, military radar, uh, pulsed microwaves, high-powered microwaves, millimeter waves, a whole range, infrasonic, ultrasonic, you know, so they have this whole range of weapons which are deadly and barbaric. And they actually, I think that the crux of their evil derives from how closely they affect the human body or the animal body, really, any animal body, and um, destroy the tissue and destroy the organs, you know, so they literally go into the human body. So when you have weapons that do this, and of course, you know, on the other hand, we have the regular, the traditional, the conventional weapon, and we know what they are, right? The guns, the, the grenades, the bombs. They also destroy human tissue. They also destroy animals and human life. But they're very visible. They're, they're very material. The, their effect is very material and concrete and visible. And because it is, human rights advocates around the world, human rights groups around the world, can speak out very openly about what can be actually seen and tracked visibly. The, the power of these weapons, obviously, the, the, stealth, the, um, the electromagnetic radiation and spectrum weapons derives from the, their stealth aspect, from the fact that they can be used covertly because they are using radiation and sonics that cannot be seen by the, by the naked human eye, right? Or even by most cameras. I do understand there's some technology that can be captured by cameras. I think we have pictures of nasers coming into people's homes and so forth. Um, and, you know, we need to publicize those pictures because these beams of radiation are not imaginary beams. They actually exist. They are being directed from various sources at people. So I think that whole um, aspect of non-legality really needs to be challenged because, as you said, that is military doublespeak to call something non-lethal. Well, I think, first of all, we talked about this before, and I think Karen was here um, to talk about um, an expert that she knows within the military who has come forward and who actually uh, can be quoted because he, um, I think, spoke to Wired. I've seen those articles. That's Paul Gobat, Paul David Gobat. And he, is, uh, he was present on an Air Force base when so-called non-lethal weapons were tested on a bunch of goats brought in, trucked in in the middle of the night, okay, so that the active denial system could be tested on them. And he's witness to the incineration of those goats. And that's what he has spoken about. So in other words, these non-lethal weapons are only lethal insofar as you stop using them, as you pulse at somebody and then stop the pulses and then start up the pulses again. So they are lethal. They are actually lethal weapons. 
They can yeah. be used non-lethally, maybe for a small moment of time, but they're actually lethal weapons. Yeah, and I guess the, the really, um, you know, the, the big realization that also people are not aware about is that, um, and not aware of, is that the military these days, um, um, you know, is um, not just using these lethal weapons, which they term non-lethal to be able to sell them, you know, and use them freely, but also they're using them on civilians. And they're using them on in, in total, utter contravention of the Geneva Conventions, yes. right? Makes them all instantaneously war criminals. So we have to, we are now face waking up to a situation whereby our entire top leadership in the military and military, military intelligence are war criminals. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to say from the US point of view as well, the way they have um, you know, uh, permitted this to happen for themselves is by making deals, secret deals. Uh, so the D Department of Defense has made deals with the Department of Justice to provide local law enforcement with classified non-lethal weapons. This is in addition to the public domain uh, weapons that we know the PDs are using, the police departments are actually using, and that the ACLU has been keeping track of. Those are the through wall surveillance radar weapons you know, which are damaging in themselves, which have precisely the same effects as you mentioned earlier. They can go through walls and they can, they are um, used to um, find people inside rooms. They're used to track people inside rooms and they're used to pulse organs. So it, this is literally physical surveillance. So in addition to this, that's now public domain and that's, you know, written about and spoken about in mainstream media as through wall surveillance radar, you also have classified non-lethal weapons, which they are not divulging any information about. I have actually foyered the Massachusetts Fusion Center. I've tried to find out what kind of um, non-lethal weapons are being used by them. And they wrote back and said to me, uh, no responsive documents. And in the interest of public safety, we cannot divulge any information on this. You know, I'm asking in the interest of public safety, and this is the answer I get. So I think that it is an irresponsible answer. And I also think it is a very obfuscating answer, you know? because they're keeping it secret and so i think secrecy has a great great deal to do with this so not only have they created these secret memos of understanding with the department of justice which they don't divulge to the people but which we know about thanks to the investigative journalism of dr nick begich and various others you know and which i have written about i've written about this so these memos are not in dispute these memos have been created these memos of understanding have been created between the dod and the doj but what weapons exactly are being used is not being divulged. And the other thing is they're hiding it under names like surveillance, surveillance devices. Well, what surveillance devices are these? What physical surveillance is this? You know, what biometric surveillance is this? Because so these are words that are being used to wrap up the use of weaponry on civilians. So in other words, they can shoot me in my liver, which I have experienced going to the library and call that physical surveillance. You know, so I have actually taken pictures of this one guy who tracks me, who follows me around in Milton Library, top to bottom, wherever I am, carrying his backpack innocuously, standing next to me, and then lifting his backpack. And as soon as he lifts it, I can feel the shot, the pulsed shot in my liver, but only because I'm wearing a bit of shielding right there, because I've experienced this before. If I did not wear that shielding, I would not hear the shot. You see, it would go directly into my body. So I have personally actually recorded it as a witness. They are doing this. They're carrying these weapons and backpacks. They're carrying them in their purses. Women, by the way, are very much involved in this as well as men. I can, I can confirm both, actually. Sorry, to, yeah, I just want to interject this because everything you said I can confirm. Actually, just this week, I um, popped to the shops and um, there was again a street theater theme, scene, but it unfolded such that, you know, I, I just went onto the main road. I was walking on the um, on the sidewalk and suddenly I was hit in the head massively so that I could hear cavitation popping at the base of my skull and in my head. Um, and then um, um, a workman's um, kind of pickup truck um, overtook me and parked demonstratively. So imagine a fast road where people don't pull over and park. He just pulled over climbed up onto the pavement and just stood there 
So I was walking past, and as, he, as I was walking past, he was holding a mobile phone. So I'm not sure if he used a mobile phone to trigger an electromagnetic gun, you know, that was aiming at me inside his car, or if it was somewhere in a backpack or maybe in his phone. I have no idea where these weapons are. But imagine, that was the street theater scene. Then I, 50 meters on, I reached the supermarket. And, you know, gang stalking by teenagers, half of whom are young women, but swarming, you know, there was a crowd of them outside. This is totally not normal for the area where this um, supermarket was. And then you go in, you've got the, this typical pattern of swarming and gang stalkers everywhere, cuffing when you walk past and so on. And when I came out, people are waiting, looking over the shoulder. And when I come out, that's when they start walking, you know. So I, I filmed the car that had stopped. I filmed the gang stalking theater, you know, in the parking lot, a guy standing there, you know, everyone wearing pink as well. Big guy standing there in a, in a pink T-shirt, you know, in the middle of the car park, pretending like you would actually stop in the middle of the lane and have a phone call. So it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. But yes, I have been shot at from cars young women are involved and most outrageously i can't remember if it was after the second or the third high court hearing but after the first high court hearing i was shot in the head in my hotel room until i collapsed twice the second time before my husband but after the second court hearing i or the third i went back to london heathrow and i was inside the security zone in london heathrow and there was just um these um kind of seat seating areas and there was a, a round seating area and then some um you know some benches behind and i was just on the round bit sitting on the edge and suddenly just like you i was massively shot into my back and my liver but agonizingly painfully so i got out my phone and i started to film and i all i did is i took the phone set it on film and just went like this just held it you know to see and exactly as i was filming the, there were two young women which you can see on this film who burst out laughing so one of them had a phone you know, looking at me, and then they burst out laughing. So they either used their phone or, it, she also had a big handbag, mm -hmm. the, the weapon wasn't there, and shot at me, triggering it with my with her phone, mm -hmm. and then laughing about it. So this yeah. is absolutely ridiculous. And actually, if people um, want to see how you can actually hide an electromagnetic weapon inside a handbag, so this device, this is an antenna here, okay? It looks very sci-fi. People probably seen it when they've seen my videos. Now this, in my case, is connected to a detector because I'm trying to detect attacks with, um, you know, this. And there's a little blue cable with which I can connect it, you know, to the detector. But if you put a little frequency generator here, then this is an attack weapon. And you can really- How, how big is the frequency generator, do you think? Um, the, the, the actual frequency generator is just a little box. It's kind of the size of these two bars here. So okay. if you put it on, it's just a little box like that. It's not much bigger. But if I take off the handle at the bottom, which you don't need, this black thing at the bottom is just so that I can hold on to it. You can put this flat antenna, by the way, super light. You mm -hmm. can put this flat antenna into a large handbag and mm -hmm. point it at somebody with a microwave emitter. And then you have a potentially lethal weapon. And the total cost of this is a couple of hundred euros. Right? So the, the, the shape of the antenna has something to do with the direction of the frequency? Yeah, so I think this is an antenna array. So you, inside you would have antennas of different sizes, you know, okay. small to, to big. I think this is how it's, how it's done, okay. you know, the entire antenna array. Um, but it could be used directionally. It could be used to yes, point. Yes, it's directionally. So this records directionally. So, you know, antennas work both ways. You either generate a signal and then it goes out or the mm -hmm. signal comes in and generates a current and that's what you measure. So this is both. This is a detector. I'm, I bought a detector, which, by the way, is more expensive than the weapon, um, you know, um, and then you can also use it as a weapon. But that's to give people an idea. This is what these things look like. All right. This is the size of them. It fits in any handbag and um, it's deadly and it's totally unregulated and you can buy it off the internet, mm -hmm. so, you know. Yeah, and you know, the other thing I wanted to say was people need to go to citizensagainstharmfultechnologies.org because over there, there is a picture. And if we, if one of us can bring that up, that would be fantastic on our screens right now. Um, it's, um, there is a picture of um, an open cell phone with a little instrumentation attached to the back of it. And it literally is the size of a cell phone. So, and it looks like what you were talking about regarding the microwave earlier, Catherine, where there's like um, a directional antenna, like a cathode ray tube sh kind of shape. 
um, you know, a flashlight shape, uh, kind of a tubular kind of shape uh, attached to the back of the cell phone, which is actually functioning as a directional antenna. So, and this particular device was actually dropped by somebody, a, gang, a quote unquote gang stalker, in, in a target's driveway as he was being surprised. He dropped this and ran. So this was picked up by this guy, and you know the, the picture of that is on this website, which is Neil Chevrier's website. It is caht.org, Citizens Against Harmful Technology. It's a brilliant piece of evidence to show that people are indeed using cell phones as weapons. And you know, I think cell phones, I used to think cell phones by themselves could be used as weapons, and this is what Dr. Loren Murray talks about. She talks about these flat array antennas being inside cell phones and about frequencies that can be sent from cell towers to cell phones, you know, either wittingly or unwittingly. So in other words, these guys could either be informants or snitches or whatever working on the other side to attack targets, or they could, or anybody's cell phone could be activated by these frequencies, you know, innocuously without their knowing, unwittingly. Um, so I think there is that because she talks about that. But what this particular device points to is that a cell phone can be used to hide an actual directed energy weapon, a very, very tiny directed energy weapon. By the way, if you um, briefly allow, I'm going to show you um, that device Ramola talks about because I've just looked it up. This is on um, uh, Neil Chevrier's um, website. So let me just share my screen. And um, so the, this device, so this uh, citizensaht.org is the address and on the front page if you scroll down this is the device that she talks about you can see it fits into a palm and that the generator is inside and this is the funnel where the energy would be coming out and then the opening you can just cover up by you know putting something there plastic is totally transparent to these weapons um, and and there you have it that is the um, this object was dropped by a stalker in a targeted individual's driveway as the stalker ran away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, if you look at that image just below, I think that's very interesting because some of us have been talking about satellites lately. And yeah. uh, we've been talking about uh, beams headed down toward us from satellites or from cell towers or from drones. We don't know. And you know, I actually have a picture very similar to this one um, of rays coming down from above and hitting a house. So. I was um, sitting in my sister's, oh, actually, I, my daughter was sitting in my sister's um, backyard in London last year, and my husband took a kind of a panoramic shot of her in the backyard, and at that moment, I was upstairs taking a shower, getting burned alive by microwaves coming from the top, and the picture that he captured in that moment shows a beam just like that hitting that particular side of the house where I was upstairs, you know, and hitting the house. So it's like you have to ask yourself, what is that? What is that? Is that a maser? Is that microwaves? Is that what is it exactly? But you can, but that was captured on film. So that's incredible. So also, um, you know, um, I think Karen has an image where she was attacked from a car and then she was walking and she was trying to photograph the car and the iPhone just cuts out it couldn't um take the picture so, so it, it kind of took the picture and restarted in a very rapid sequence as it was interfered with and you can see on this image the number plate being seen three times so yeah. in just one image and she, that was has, she has another image i think which she shows the car in front is actually cut in half it's almost yeah. like the, the light from it was refracted so the top half is on one side and the bottom half of the car is on the other side it's yeah so and that what that is is the um, the actual readout software, the, the readout um, hardware of the iPhone when you're taking the image. You know the little um, solid state device is being interfered with by the radiation. So that's yeah. the effects that you get. But actually, one of the things I wanted to briefly show because um, Millicent, um, so Dr. Millicent Black can't be with us today, but um, it was very close to our heart that um, we show two short clips, and they are very very important speeches actually. And um, so the, because she wanted to sh um, bring home to us just how um, old the problems with the military and uh, military intelligence actually are and the problems with secrecy. So um, 
And the first one I would like to start with is actually JFK's, um, John F. Kennedy's um, speech on secrecy, which I just brought up in the background in just a few minutes, but just listen to what he has got to say, because secrecy goes to the heart of the matter, just as Ramola said. Um, so let me just share my screen. I hope you can hear the video. Let me know if you can't. Um, it's here. So this was in 1961. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence. in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. So just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to stop here. There are two, two and a half minutes still left. Um, but, you know, um, so I will put the link into the actual um, notes. But what's really important to take away from this is that um, already Kennedy um, in 61 was, so, you know, just think this is 50, 56 years ago, okay. Um, already then, half a century ago, he warned, um, first of all, about secrecy in itself. And, you know, what I kept saying is that secrecy automatically leads to deep capture. So any system that has any sort of secrecy it automatically leads to deep capture by psychopaths and by criminals in any system. So if a system is larger than 100 people, in 100 people you've got between one and six psychopaths. So they will rise to the top because their urge and desire is to control others. So already if your system is larger than 100 people, deep capture by psychopaths is guaranteed. If your system is larger than 100 people, and some argue that already within 100 people you have some criminals, you will have a guarantee, uh, a guaranteed deep capture by criminals. So when we're talking large systems like intelligence agencies or any other or secret courts, 
by the way, um, secret automatically, if, it's, if this organization is very large or if it's very old, it automatically means it's in deep capture already by certainly psychopaths and most likely criminals. It is a law of physics. It's a law of system physics. And that's exactly what Kennedy said. And then in the second half of the, um, the quotes I showed, he was specifically warning against a monolithic global conspiracy. And, you know, in earlier episodes, we said, well, you know, conspiracy theory has been um, used as a psyop term by the CIA. So it actually helps your mind to think of conspiracies just as people deciding to work together for profit as in a business plan. So there seems to be a global monolithic business plan which is operating um, with people, as he put it, you know, in, in, the, in the military, in the intelligence agencies, in the diplomatic services, which are infiltrated by the intelligence agencies, if not entirely run by them, you know, but also the press and in the entire public life. And this monolithic business plan is super secret. And as I said, secrecy, if it's that big, leads to criminality. So what this is, he's talking about a, actually a criminal system, a psychopathic criminal system that's worldwide. And in the second half, I will talk about what this a big um, psychopathic system does, but it includes the military. And the military, because of its compartmentalization and need to know, and military intelligence, because that and added secrecy, it follows that they by now are in deep capture by psychopathic criminals that are networked globally, as in global organized crime. And that was already de facto the case in the, um, the 50s, the early 60s, when Kennedy gave the speech. So now, 50 years on, when 50 years ago, you can already deduce that all the militaries and all the intelligence agencies must have already been in deep capture by organized crime. Now, what does it look like today? You know? Yeah, so that's yeah, actually... Yeah. Hmm? Sorry. I didn't mean I to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I'm finished. finished on this part. Oh, okay. okay. I was. I'm hearing an echo. Oh, it's gone now. Okay. So, um, in, in terms of secrecy, I think, and and where military intelligence comes into play, I think it's very important to mention as well, because we've been talking a great deal up to this point about directed energy weapons and non-lethal weapons, and I think that is the base. For what is being done and what is being used by military intelligence. But I think we need to establish that what mil military intelligence is going one step further, and they are using directed energy weapons for the remote um, manipulation of human, not just human bodies, but also human brains. In other words, we need to mention neurotechnology, I think, and we need to talk about how neurotechnology has been taken over by military intelligence and been taken over by, well, not just military intelligence. We know it's these are uh, operations and programs being run by the Central Intelligence Agency and by pretty much every intelligence agency on the globe, I think, all working together, as you've pointed out before, Catherine, in your exposés of how the intel agencies appear to have agreements with each other, they're working with each other, and in a sense, who they're working against is the vast mass of the civilian population. Um, so, um, you know, and if you look at, for instance, Project Soulcatcher, which is written by Robert Duncan, who used to work for the CIA and so forth, he's talking at length about how the CIA and DIA are working together on these remote neural monitoring programs, these remote, um, you know, neurotechnology programs that essentially are seeking both to neurally map the human brain and uh, influence the human brain through many, many different kinds of technologies. And to, to trace that again, you go back in time to, you know, it's like all roads lead to Rome, you head right back to MK Ultra, you know, in the 60s and 70s, those programs of remote behavior modification that the CIA was running. And of course, they were running it using various, they were exploring all sorts of avenues to, to find ways to manipulate humans and uh, make humans do things that they would not normally do, change people's personalities, hypnotize humans, you know, creating the, the perfect double agent, somebody who would have no memory of the ghastly, dastardly deeds that they committed while under 
the influence of radio hypnosis and so forth. So, and uh, the use of electromagnetic radiation to affect brains was one part of their, um, their whole smorgasbord there of um, things that they were doing to humans. I believe it was Star Project 119 that uh, used EMF radiation to influence brains. And then after the 70s, as we know, we had the church committee, and then things went underground. And we heard about how they continued from various writers and investigative journalists, such as Alex Constantine, you know, who talked about how they resurfaced in cults. So the cult syndrome in the US, and then now we have the active shooter syndrome. So all of these can be traced right back to MKUltra and what MKUltra was doing with dissociative uh, identity disorder, trying to dissociate people, MK, uh, monarching, all that stuff. And um, so you have the CIA continuing their experiments with remote behavior modification. And you also have the US Air Force and you have with its um, SEER programs, which are the survival, evasion, resistance, torture programs, which they were putting their MN through, you know, to supposedly um, give them, a, give um, captured airmen a means of resisting capture and brainwashing when in enemy, enemy territory. But in other words, they were practicing methodologies of torture, which if you look at are very closely related to the kind of experiments the CIA was conducting. So I think there are definite connections. And there are many historians, by the way, who have, who have um, teased out these connections and talked openly about it. The connections between uh, the CIA's and Ultra and the Air Force's um, SEER programs. And, and ultimately, as you know, Mitchell and Jess and those two psychologists who were working on the, um, the people in the CIA torture programs you know, overseas, um, those guys were US Air Force psychologists who had actually helped devise the SEER program for the US Air Force. And then they came along and helped the CIA develop the waterboarding and other programs. Um, all criminal all illegal and all incredibly inhumane, incredibly barbaric, you know, for the CIA in various foreign countries. Um, so you have those connections. <laughs> and also the military. So, you know, I think what's been going on is uh, what the CIA started with the MKUltra has been continued by the US Air Force and continued by the US military and continued by DIA. So at this point in time, when we talk about actually military intelligence, we're talking about some kind of coming together of all of these different branches, it's sort of interagency cooperation between the CIA and the DIA and DARPA as well, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and IARPA, which is the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency, as well as the US Air Force and the, and the DOD, the sort of the vast mess of the DOD, which is the Department of Defense in its entirety. So all of those and add in a whole bunch of secrecy, they keep it all undercover. Um, and they were able to share information and continue. But now they're working at the level of the human brain, they are really attacking and assaulting the human brain, and they want to keep it under wraps. So they continue to, call, to keep this information classified. So anyway, I'll stop there. Oh, no, exactly. Sorry, I, 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 so if you heard any echo, that was me occasionally turning on my microphone. Um, sorry. Um, but, um, you know, the, um, what I wanted to say is that actually exactly what you said, you know, it's it spread um, from the agencies, um, you know, from the CIA to all the other agencies. Um, and then I would also say that it's it spread into um, hospitals, psychiatric wards, universities. In other words, it was industrialized. It was industrialized. That's what it means. And um, on YouTube, there's um, videos where people talk about having gone through um, trauma-based mind control experiments in hospitals. But these are, you know, women under 30. So, um, you know, that's exactly what we're seeing. And I think it's very, very good that um, you emphasize the secrecy, because if you understand complex um, human systems, you immediately know that when you have these large um, groups of people, operating under secrecy, they are already in deep capture by criminals. And then the only question is, so these are criminal operations. That's why they're against the Geneva Conventions. That's why they mutilate people. That's why they destroy lives. They don't care. They're criminals. So we have, you know, by induction, criminals heading the military 
and military intelligence and, and a bunch of other institutions that are all in it together um, in that sense. Um, but then the question is, who are the criminals and where are they, you know, what's their gender and where are they coming from? Um, and that's when it gets really, really interesting because, for example, the entire MK Ultra programs, I think one can um, trace back um, certainly to the uh, participation of all those um, scientists and doctors who were um, spirited out of Nazi Germany. These are Nazi Germans, you know, the Nazi, Nazi German scientists um, and Nazi German doctors who went to the US or were brought over um, under Project Paperclip. And if I, if I remember correctly, I mean, there must have been many rat lines, but they were brought there through Switzerland, through neutral Switzerland you know, put on boats going down to Italy. Hmm? What might be the connection to Italy and organized crime, I wonder. And then off to America. So that's number one. And then the other thing is also, um, uh, actually, Italy um, has, um, and it's very interesting that you use the expression, um, all, lo all roads lead to Rome, because that's a very old expression. And it's usually used to imply that somehow people meant the road networks, you know, because the, the uh, Roman soldiers were such great road builders. And they take it literally, all roads will lead to Rome because the empire was always connected up with Rome. That's not what the saying is. Um, it's not literal. Um, it, and that's because people throughout the ages were trying to find out where does all this criminality come from? How come that things are this bad? You know, and as I said, we have the same criminality today that already JFK saw half a century ago. And the people before that and before that, going back centuries, all saw the same criminality, you know. And then they said all roads lead to Rome. What could they have possibly meant? Well, as we explained earlier, you know, take, for example, spying. So, um, you know, there are some, I also wanted to talk later about the, the, the self-portrayal of the spies and talk about some books, you know, and histories, official uh, histories about the spy agencies in Britain, which are the, the, the greatest uh, volumes of Tosh. But anyway, um, you know, they tried to portray this image that spying agencies were just, you know, some were just founded in the 20th century. That's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. So the spies uh, and military intelligence were around already as soon as they were large organizations. So all the royal households had their own spying networks and certainly the church had a massive spying network. But the church had to keep under surveillance all the royal households, right? And all the other far flung um, places where there were churches. Therefore, it follows that actually the church had always the biggest spy network. It must have because it was bigger than any of the royal households, its reach was bigger, therefore the church had the first global intelligence agency. And we're going back, you know, um, thousands of years, actually. But yeah, it's called the Jesuit Order. Yes, it's called the Jesuit Order. Yes, because the Jesuit Order, that's why they are so military, because they are military intelligence, that, that's what they are. That's right. And, and therefore, the, the black pope, the head of the, um, the Jesuits, is the head of the military enforcement arm of the Vatican. But we also said, you know, in previous episodes that the Vatican and even considers itself the head of the snake, as they showed in the Nervi Hall in the Vatican, you know, which is literally in the shape of a, of a snake, the head of a snake. But what it means is when you have such an ancient organization and all the secrecy, it follows that the oldest intelligence agency must have been very quickly in deep capture by psychopaths and by criminals, by organized crime. All right, so that means from pretty much very soon after the, the, you know, the establishment of these intelligence agencies, they were already in deep capture by organized crime. So any organized crime, and if, if the intelligence agency was global, it means that the global organized crime network goes back to the, the early days of the church. End of story. And, and hence, it is from that, so if we're now fast forwarding in time, it is through that that the, the hub of the intelligence agency always stayed where it was, which was in Europe, you know. And this is why to, to even imagine that somehow the CIA would be independent of the old European intelligence agencies is a total fantasy. It's impossible. Because as soon as America was settled, you know, the royal households wanted to have a, a piece of the action, and so did the church. 
So they all went in with their intelligence agencies and there would have never ever been an independent intelligence agency founded by the people, nonsense. I mean, if it ever had been, it would have been infiltrated. So any intelligence agency in the US is just a branch office of the first ever global intelligence agency that was owned by the Vatican. But as soon as you had, um, you know, the settlement in the US came the spies and came organized crime because it's the most profitable business. It's not taxed. Okay. So I then, just wanted to make, make hmm? one tiny interjection. I think that the um, creation of the CIA occurred with the National Secrecy Act, if I'm not mistaken, in 1947. So you're right, it was many years later after, you know, the, uh, the American enterprise sort of came into being. So, exactly. and, and after, after 1947, after the National Secrecy Act came into being, all manner of, of things, of activities, have been rolled into the classified world, into, you know, black ops and covert ops. It's been, they've been covered up. And that's when all of the difficulties have begun in our societies where it, it, well in the us where you literally cannot question the cia because if they want to they can just jump in and say it's national security it's classified we can't talk about it and they've been doing it this in the courts they've been doing before this the cia it was the oss oh so right the oss yeah. the office of strategic services Something right like that. yeah so i just wanted to throw that in there you know because secrecy is sort of <laughs> acquired a new meaning after the Second World War in this country and after those people with Nazis were brought in and after all of those secret programs uh, started to get revved up, you know, and then we saw some of it revealed through the NK Ultra revelations in the 70s. But I, think, I, think, I think a major thing that happened during the 20th century, and I, I think it was after the war, but I'm sure somebody in the chat room will tell me, it's when the, the the, the, the War Department became the Defense Department. Um, you see, the War Department is like a out there fighting a war against an enemy. Mm -hmm. The Defense Department is anything we need to do to make you safe. And that means we can pile secrecy on, on top of secrecy on top of secrecy and, and uh, let us do anything we want to do in the name of defense right that you is see, exactly what happened and actually at that point perhaps is when the department of defense actually became the department of offense but used the word defense as military doublespeak to cover up what it was really doing and as we all know the u.s has been the world's greatest warmonger right for however many decades at this point brilliant very brilliant and, and you know what, I think also that, um, I think this is such a, a very good point because by renaming it the Department of War, the, the Department of Defense, you have also this Orwellian doublespeak because it stayed, it, it, what actually happened is that the Department of War just, you know, subsumed the Department of Defense and then just became bigger. And it's now just all out war that they are in charge of. But I think what's very important to realize is that it is a, you know, um, I mean, Ramola, you never implied that, but, um, you know, the, uh, when they founded the CIA in the 1957, uh, in nine, was 1957, you said, and before it was the OSS. So there was already an organization beforehand. And it would, be a fan, it would be a fantasy to imagine that you just found, an, a, a, you know, newly found an intelligence agency that wasn't there before. But you didn't say that. But there's a new history, authorized history of MI6, where they try to claim exactly that. They said, oh, yeah, you know, one day this guy was given a bit of money and then he sat down in his office and he had to just, you know, just, yeah, found MI6. And, and they literally present it like that. We just think, bullshit. Like, did that, did that just come out of your mouth? You know, but yeah, it did. You know, that's exactly what they're claiming. And if you read this authorized history, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, and he made little notes in his logbook saying, oh, today there was, again, not much to do. Bullshit. You know, if anything... This guy was tasked with, with founding some sort of front, a front that maybe you interface with government with, because after the Second World War, you know, you had to pretend that you're transparent. So you had an official um, intelligence agency, which you then call the CIA, Langley, you know, and then you try to work with government and all that. That's all nonsense. I think this was always, it has always been a fantasy beforehand. And today what we're seeing is a puppet show 
for us, you know. We've got little things going like, oh, yeah, we're my five, and oh, yes, we're my six. And, and then you think, yeah, but what happened to am I, you know, one to four and seven to whatever, 22 or whatever they had during the war? You know, what happened to those guys? Did you all sack them? I don't think so. I've never heard of an intelligence agency getting smaller. They just go black. They just go silent, you know. Um, and that's a very important right. question, actually. Hmm? If they, if they want to talk about the history of MI6, they have to start back with John D. John D. was uh, 007 for your eyes only. You know, that's how that that's how that moniker came about, the 007. Later on in his documents, he would draw a little moniker like uh, the, the queen used to wear, you know, would she put up to her face. That's the 007. So he would send things for her eyes only. And it would have that 007 on there. That's why John D became the first 007. The story of John. He was very loyal to the Queen, and I think he started off as a pretty, pretty decent, very brilliant guy. He was the astrologer to the Queen, I believe. And uh, he became gradually obsessed with alchemy and uh, finding how to create gold from uh, other metals. You know, that's the, the what do they call it? The, secret something well anyway told himself to angels that he was talking with he was communicating with angels and they were giving him uh, clues to how he could put this together and they didn't divulge themselves as being demons till much later till he was as starting to do very evil things with it so the origin, in my mind, of, of the most recent incarnation of the Selective Services goes back to John D., who uh, was the first Secret Service agent and became totally corrupted, totally taken over by the demons that he and his, his friend were incorporating. So, just a little history from an old guy. And today's his birthday. Oh, today's his birthday, somebody sang on the, uh, on the chat. So there you go. There you go. So what what age are we talking about? What what uh, what year centuries was this guy from? Sorry. It was a regional Queen Elizabeth, Victorian or a little bit before. I think it's around the 15th, 16th century. Okay, because okay. then then already he's not the he's not the first guy, you know, leading. Okay. He was, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's no way. So this is what I'm saying. The intelligence agencies go back as long as the royal households. They they do, and they go back as long as the church, and then before that, the Roman Empire, and before that, other empires. So they have been with us from day one. You know, like prostitution, <laughs> it is you know one of the oldest professions, and um, so there's absolutely no way that they, they were just founded. And last time already we spoke about the CIA being a branch office called CIA Langley, and actually the the real headquarters is elsewhere. And when you want to find out where the old headquarter is, well, you know, I mean the old headquarter will be where the old headquarter of the Vatican is, you know. Um, but then also because we said the Vatican is must be in deep capture by organized crime because it's so powerful, the head of the mafia will be co-located with it, you know. So then this is where this expression all roads lead to Rome comes from because if you look at the intelligence agencies, where are the spies headquartered? Well, where the church is headquartered. Where does all the, you know, organized crime money go? Well, or it seems to go to Rome. You know, and where does all the where does religion and all the brainwash and the psyops go from? Political influence, it all all goes back to Rome, because that's where the the big hub is. You know, this big octopus is, um, or the head of the snake, as they call themselves, is there. Um, but you know what? It is just so interesting how this sort of simple fact keeps to be covered up by the individual branch officers um, elsewhere. And and so sorry, by the way, now that we're talking about the head office, I mean the the Vatican. That's where you know. Traditionally, that's where you locate the, the white pope, the head of the psyops, the psyop division, the PR division, you know, being religion, then the black pope being the military enforcement arm, the head of the Jesuits, you know, um, and then they've got the gray pope, which I think is in charge of the finance, you know, of the money, and, and he must be the most important one because he pays the others, you know, and then he interfaces with the old crime families and so on, and, and they call themselves the royal bloodlines and, and whatnot, but that's the structure, it must be the structure. And that's why all roads lead to Rome. 
But then also, you know, um, Rome itself and the Vatican is tiny, so they must have somewhere really big, massive fort complex, you know, and then there's the whatever, you know, they've got this little little fort somewhere where the popes retire when they want just a, some quiet time. I always forget what it's called, but that's not it because it's just too, you know, small and pathetic. So there must be somewhere the biggest intelligence agency in the world, the first global intelligence agency, must have some massive HQ somewhere. So where's the biggest fortification near to Rome? Well, you know, you've got water either side and much flat land and not, you know, yeah, not it's not very defendable. But then you've got Switzerland, which is really, and for a long time, it was Im impermeable, you know. Um, it was very, very inaccessible. And that's why Switzerland now these days it has you know military bunkers and and at some point they released some you know um, under freedom of information the the um, vault systems and they discovered that oh well you know every every village is connected to every other village through tunnels you know and, and the Swiss mountains look like Swiss cheese it is literally the biggest military bunker complex you know. Uh, uh, until until recently, I think it was overtaken by the Himalayas, which is also pretty inaccessible. You know, it must be. But until, you know, until very recently, it was still the biggest um, uh, here in Europe, the biggest uh, bunker, uh, you know, complex. And it must have the highest density of military installations, you know, maybe, maybe paralleled by places like Norway, you know, on, on the coast of Norway, because there I just expect also to have massive, you know, hidden um, underground facilities interfacing with the sea and submarine bases and, you know, whatnot. But these are the these are the sort of locations. But therefore, traditionally, it's actually Switzerland. That's um, did, you, did you say that these military installations came up recently or have they been? No, 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 no. I, I said until recently, um, oh, okay. I think, I mean, in terms of human history, until recently, Switzerland must have been the HQ. <laughs> of this um this entire operation the organized crime operation the military operation all together because the two are fused you know since the days of jesus christ have been yeah. fused, must have been but also it has a very special location right it's sort of a valley surrounded by the alps and so it's very protected in a way naturally protected by those mountain ranges exactly so the, the alps the has a that uh, all the people in Maputo are armed. Everybody talks about the United States, they want to keep their arms. Well, Switzerland has always encouraged people to be armed, even with uh, Uzis. Mm -hmm. Yes, so and you know, an armed that's very too. interesting because hasn't Switzerland also been the one so-called neutral country? through all the wars and it's sort of a non-aligned country and so forth. And well, if, you, if, you, if you're puppeting all sides of the war and you have all your money in Switzerland, you're not going to puppet them to go into Switzerland. Right, so you're you know, going to take extra pains to protect them by calling Switzerland non-aligned and neutral. Neutral with big double quotes around it. So, so Catherine, your theory before was that, there, that the money that is in Switzerland is being ferried out through the Goddard Tunnel. And uh, we know that they're going to set up their headquarters in China, assume that the gold is going to be ferried out and along the, uh, what do they used to call the thing, the, the Silk Route over into China. Is yeah. that what you're thinking? What I'm thinking is it's it's almost you know um correct to a T. What I'm thinking is it's um uh, everything, not just gold, but also military equipment, maybe um you know production lines of robots, robot army, drones, whatever, any sort of military equipment, weapons arsenals, anything you want to put into your biggest army complex, you know, vault system, is going to be ferried out. Um, it is going to be taken, I would say, you know, the, the whole point of the Gotthard Tunnel is to uh, facilitate and speed up this process of clearing it all out. And I think um, the organized crime cartel is now relocating to China. That's right. I don't think it's being taken to Rome because there's not, not enough space to stuff things. You know, I don't think I think under Rome, there's a big, um, you know, complex as well. But uh, there's not enough space to fit Switzerland in there. But for sure, there's enough space in the Himalayas. 
and we discussed all these, you know, um, organized crime type of events of, you know, I think it was the Nepalese um, royal household where one person just killed the rest of the family and so on. I mean, that we already mentioned that that's typical of, you know, electromagnetic and mind control sort of actions combined with organized crime taking over the country. And I think what that was, that those were the traces of the organized crime cartel moving into you know into the himalayas and and then actually controlling all the the territory around it and really taking over and establishing that as a new base so this is why i would say mongolia nepal all the the himalaya regions i think are now being the the bigger and better switzerland and it is for this precise reason that i also expect that the organized crime cartel will first of all want to cut ties cover its um tracks and most importantly eliminate competition eliminate competition and this is why i expect that in this process um you know you had the big satanic opening of the gotthard tunnel so it must have been important you know and i talked to some swiss person here who informed me that there's this um folklore about uh the canton of yuri um and i think i can't remember the, the story but it was that um the devil came and made a, a bet with them and they won it um, because the people there are so clever and that's why the, the devil had to build a bridge for them there or something like that. But now if I take this anecdote, the entire Gotthard opening sounds to me very much like the devil's back and this time he's going to win. And this time he's going to screw absolutely everybody and make off with all the loot, right? And that's what, how I read it and everybody else going to die, you know? <laughs> so to the people of Yuri, I would say now pull off what you did last time and be clever because I think this is what's being played out. You know, and that's where the Gotthard Tunnel is. And also quite telling me, I mean, you know, I, I think, hmm, sorry? Go ahead, sorry. No, I Go think ahead. also there's the symbolism, you know, with the, the um, I mean, it's, it's so funny because it's connecting um, Italy. So I think the entire in and out, in and out motion of the trains of the Gotthard Tunnel, you know, in the south side of Switzerland is, is kind of symbolically screwing Switzerland from Italy, you know, kind of. Yeah. Am I wrong in the symbolism? But that's very much what it looks like to me. Also, you know? if you follow the, uh, it's a got hard tunnel. Got hard. It's, these, these are sex cults. These are sex cults. What can I say? Okay, so they're going to go to the Himalayas. Now, under the Himalayas, uh, supposedly, is Shambhala and Agartha. One is the. the uh, the kingdom of, uh, and the other is the kingdom of darkness. And supposedly, uh, there are uh, Asian, uh, China, well, I, they're, they're in the Himalayas, so they could be from another, a number of countries. But uh, they're very adept, um, what can I say, shaman, called the green men. Are you talking about the Tibetan Buddhists? Yeah, well, they're, they're called the Green Men. I know that yeah. from the story that I'm, I'm relating. And uh, supposedly, in the in the uh, when they uncovered the bunker uh, in Berlin, where uh, who have been killed, there were Asians there. They had green gloves on them because the green gloves are a lower level of the Green Men, who are from these ancient societies under the himalayans so they you know the people that discovered them wondered why there's asians in berlin at this time but apparently there might have been a connection between hitler and one of these civilizations i can never remember which one's the good one and which one's the bad one or, or where these green men came from but uh if it all leads back to the himalayans then there's a whole lot of folklore that we can weave into this story That's all I know. I wish I could. Yeah, I think we're talking about sort of, it's sort of possibly a connection between you know the, those very ancient Tibetan Buddhist civilizations up in the Himalayas, and you know what you're talking about, the Shambhala and Agartha, and as well as um, with the European um, through Switzerland, you know, European connection through Switzerland, um, and that that there is a possibility that those tunnels are connected. And I think there are, you know, people who've been talking about these tunnels, various experts, and literally saying that the entire earth is kind of riddled with tunnels like this. 
deep and oh, yeah. and there are connections in Google. That's probably true. There's maps and tunnels under the United States that have been put in recently, but there are old. Uh, that's they're old tunnels, right? And this is not to do with the the dams, the deep underground military bases that the military well, has the been digging up around the country. The, the dams are supposedly connected by these things too, but uh, you know we're talking about the the. Uh, the, the, the people that we don't see, the, the whole society we don't know about, the secret secrets, you know, the, 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 the real secrets below the secrets. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know what, but I know that, uh, that Hitler did make many Himalayans, and that area has been deeply connected to uh, uh, probably uh, both sides of the coin, you know, the, the black and the white, uh, the, the devil and whatever the light source might be. So, yeah, so we're, we're hitting, I think we're hitting at, at, at exactly what's happening here. We're, we're, we seem to do this every once in a while. We're able to parse a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of hit, we're hitting to the core of the secrets now. So there's not just, you know, military secrets that we know about that are hidden under classified labels. There are deeper and deeper secrets that are being hidden from humans, you know, as part of right. our history, perhaps. And the, trick is, and the trick is to extricate the, the truth from all of these secrets that they've been hiding under layers and layers and layers of secrets. Uh, that's that's our way out of this, I, th I think, mm -hmm. knowing more and more and more and trying to figure out uh, where they're going with this. Yeah, yes. and actually at this point, I wanted to just mention, you know, recently Catherine had um, a wonderful conversation with Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot. And uh, literally, Kerry Cassidy is sort of a leading investigative reporter in this space, you know, the above top secret space, where she interviews very many people, scientists and whistleblowers, um, you know, from the military, from intelligence, from various countries, um, on precisely this kind of subject, you know, to try to find out what really is being hidden from all of us. And this whole story of the tunnels, if I'm not mistaken, is something that she has covered in some of her interviews. But I can't call to mind. I think I have to go back and look through her library of interviews. Same with me. I've read stuff on this. Actually, I've even done podcasts a long, long time ago on this. But I can't remember exactly. Uh, but now, uh, it thinks that the, the path is up to the Himalayans, then all of a sudden mm -hmm. this becomes very very deep and very relevant and uh, you might even have some background Ramola in uh, in learning about this stuff from your 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 international background oh well I think I'm, I come as nearly to the subject of you know what's happening with um, with Tibet as everybody else trying to find out because I've read a little bit about Shambhala about Agartha and I've read a little bit about the great powers of some of these Tibetan Buddhist sects the kind of things that they can do um, and, you know, there are groups of people around India, too, you know, among the yogi, in the yogi world, like the, the Siddhas, I think, in South India, who have similar so-called supernatural powers, um, who can do all sorts of things, like control their autonomic nervous system and things like that. The kind of things which, by the way, the military has been studying recently in the last 20 years. Um, and that goes into the realm of parapsychology and so on. Because, um, of course, the military wants full spectrum dominance, right? So they want to know everything that the human human body can do, the human brain can do. They want to know everything about everything. And they frequently put out that they do know everything about everything. And so forth. Because, you know, this is all about power and control, ultimately. All of this that's happening to us, yeah. that's happening to countries around the world, is about power and control. It's, as you said, ultimately it comes back to a group of lunatics and psychopaths, as you say, frequently Catherine, <laughs> a bunch of um, psychopaths running criminal ops on the rest of us. And, they're and so insanely obsessed with power. Yes, and, and, and also, not just that, they also, um, they absolutely true, they're totally insanely obsessed with power, as you say. And behind the scenes, they've got an organized crime cartel to run them. I think that's another thing, they've got a business to run, a family business to run, you know, the old families, you know. Yes, you know. When now we're talking about um, digging out the truth about the military, I'm sorry, I seem to be getting um, echo. I wanted to just share my screen 
Um, very briefly, because I wanted to, I, I talked about this in one of my videos, but I would like to talk about it on the forum, because so much about the military is about deception, you know, a lot. And, and it's about bullshitting people. And um, people inside the military bullshit each other so like professionals, you know. And I want to give you a fantastic example of that. And that is, um, now that we talk about the Vatican and the Swiss, you know, Switzerland, um, there's the historian Sean Ross, um, who's, I think, South um, African, but is now living in Switzerland. And he makes the point that Switzerland was founded when the Knights Templars were ki uh, kicked out of Jerusalem. So then, you know, the, the uh, time difference between them being kicked out and the founding of Switzerland is roughly the time it takes to ride on horseback from there back to Switzerland. So I think uh, he's absolutely right, because then suddenly the Vatican had this horde of mercenaries and had to think about what the hell to do with them. So they gave them this land to guard, you know, the, the old uh, hidden bunkers of the Vatican, where all the, the stuff was hidden that, you know, was put there as, you know, the, the Italians were looting around the world. So, you know, there come the Templars, they are guarding the loot and they are building the first military bunkers and all that. You know, we're going back to the 13th century here. But then also the Swiss guards were taken as the bodyguards of the Pope and they are to this day. And that's the Swiss guards. OK, so what the Swiss are doing, what the Swiss military is doing is that they're training up their bestest of the best of the very best special ops, you know, special this and that people. And they send it as send those guys to as an honorary post to be the bodyguards of the Pope. OK, so here's the link between Switzerland, the military of the Switzerland and the Vatican again. But now look what happens. Imagine your guy you went through, you know, absolutely horrific training. You survived. You're one of the best, right? You're a trained assassin and you're sent to protect, you know, the head of the snake, the Vatican. And look what happens. Um, you're given uniform. Let me just share my screen and I'll show you the uniform of the Swiss guards. The Swiss guards look like this. They are put into a clown outfit. Look at this guy. I mean, you know, if you just think away this outfit, this guy looks pretty mean. Look at that male square jaw, which looks to me like, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, hormones put into this guy. But overall, once he's in a clown outfit. Um, that is so absurd. That is an absolutely absurd, <laughs> absurd uniform. Yeah. Yes, so that, that, that is the Swiss Guards for you. This is the official um, uniform of the Swiss Guards. But um, you know, what's important to realize is that this isn't by accident a clown outfit. You know, it this is medieval. Uh, pardon? It looks medieval, you know, sort of like 15th century England. Yeah, but it isn't. Because when you look up the, um, the making of this uh, particular version of the uniform, it goes back to the early 20th century. Sorry, I just get feedback. Just um, If you just switch off Sorry. your mic just briefly because i wanted to show sure. you something that's so super interesting about this so when you look up the um, history of the swiss guards the uniforms was made by one italian guy i think in 1920 something 21 or maybe before that so and and this is classic psychopath because a psychopath you know the head of the snake the psychopaths there are not going to be thankful you know, those are a bunch of old guys, old mafiosi sitting there. They're not going to be thankful to some young chap saving their ass. No, they're going to humiliate and ridicule them by putting them into little clown outfits because they still want to remain dominant. Even though he is the fully trained soldier, they, you know, as it turns out now through the news, seem to be a bunch of pedophiles. But that's it. This is psychopaths in action. That's what they do. They try to humiliate people. They humiliate even the people who defend them. And then what's very, very interesting, actually, oh my, and that's where you really get into it. If you scroll up, they are the, they are the conditions or you have to satisfy, you know, here are the weapons that they carry around. So they're pretty modern. They're not just going around with swords. Uh, look at this. I mean, for crying out loud. But anyway, um, and somewhere here at the top, they are, oh, hang on, let me find it. The, uh, yes, here it is. The requirements for becoming a Swiss guard. And the very first condition is, must be male. Women are not permitted to apply. You know, they must be Roman Catholic, must be a citizen of Switzerland, must be at least 1 meter 70, you know, 174 meters tall, must be 19 to 30 years of age, you know, young and fit looking, must be single, 
you know, and so on. Completed service with the Swiss Army, you know, commit for to a minimum of two years. Moral and ethical upstanding. Yeah, at least somebody in the Va in the Vatican has to have that, I guess. You know, but the very first condition is must be male. I mean, okay, yes, it's a military order, you know, but just imagine what would happen in the military if there ever was a female commandant, right? I mean, what would happen? She most likely, if, if there ever was such a thing, right, a, a woman, you know, she would be pretty kick-ass because she would have gone through the training, and some women do, you know, um, but I think I'm sure here in Switzerland, you know, she might be the best sniper in Switzerland, why not? But imagine she goes there, and she has to witness what we now, you know, and it's more and more reported to be child sacrifice rituals and rampant pedophilia. And then she has to witness how these young guys, you know, and if she isn't a total combat lesbian, you know, she actually likes men. You have to see your colleagues, your male colleagues, being put into clown outfits every morning. I mean, my word, I think I know what I would do one day. I'll be like, good morning, guys. Don't bother with the or uniform today. Today we're going for combat casual, you know. And why not, after 800 years, let's make this place safe at last. Yeah? How about that? Literally. Why don't you, you go and close the gates, right? And the rest of us, let's make this place safe, you know. Really, just shoot up the place. That's what I would do, you know, if I was a military commander. I would have a little army in this, you know, teeming, heaving group of geriatric pedophiles. I mean, my word, I think any woman at some point would just flip. Literally, I would be like, guys, I know this, what we're doing is really dangerous because the walls are two meters thick and the ceilings are curved. So watch for the ricochet, you know, see you at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, you know, you have to think through, you have to work in these environments. They just go crazy. I was going to say, I just wanted to, to focus on one thing you said. So basically, these Swiss guards who are male, you feel that they might be witnesses at these super secret ceremonies with the ritual sacrifices and so forth? A hundred percent, because they have to make the place safe. They have to make the place safe. So they must know what's going on. Totally. It's yeah. kind of scary to even contemplate, because so it suggests that they are protecting these operations, but that's what they are doing. I mean, look at Britain. You know, this is the Swiss Guards, so they are an elite troop. But look at Britain, where you have literally foster parents having to run the investigation into pedophilia and have to find the rat lines themselves where children are trafficked. What the F is MI5 doing? Ask yourself, what the hell is Andrew Parker doing? They are running these operations and they are protecting these operations. Yes, exactly. And that's why we're down to single moms and foster parents having to run a criminal organization. And also the police and the Freemasons, they are protecting them. And the same with the drug trade. You know, that is a very good point. And I think we have to actually underline and emphasize that for everybody. It's that if the intelligence agencies we're really working according to their charter, according to their stated charter. They would have been able to ferret out any of these pedophilia and pedosadist operations a long, long time ago. And they would have stopped any kind of sacrificial operation, which really is homicide and genocide, you know, if more than one child is involved. So if an intel agency was really focused on that, they could have flushed all of this out. They could have flushed the real criminals out unless they were part of the criminal operation running it. Exactly. They could stop it by midday with all their, you know, surveillance tech and whatnot. Of yeah. course. Yeah. The same with the electromagnetic attacks. If they weren't doing them it themselves, if they weren't committing the crimes themselves, that's it. That's it. And that's it. It. So now, and what you're actually observing is the internet that brings us all this. So we can just search together and within minutes find out, you know, the blog pages, MI5, MI6 exposed. Hasn't or, changed, really. You know, agents complaining about um, MK Ultra mind control, the rape of female agents, murder of agents, what murder of female agents who were too ugly to be run as prostitutes, you know, uh, boiling uh, hot oil being poured um, into the uterus and onto the lower... Um, half of female um, agents um, boiling, you know, oil, 
but you know burning oil onto their breasts you know agents dying yeah totally you know it within mi5 and mi6 these people are fucking nuts sorry for swearing thank goodness medicine isn't here today but these people are totally nuts there must be statistically speaking the laws of system physics says that the top of mi5 and mi6 unless there's some sort of really powerful mechanism to reverse this must be totally you know wiped clean in the head absolutely and that's what we see and you know by just using the internet by the way you know um i mean there's a wonderful article that i should look up um saying that the um google was developed by the by the cia yes it was you know it's a darpa you know cia sort of thing which means it's a weapon therefore use it <laughs> everybody use it it's a flaming weapon use google and look for this information you know it's mind blowing. And now if you put this together, that there, there comes in information flow, a point of no return. You know, it's like you, it just all goes click, 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 and the, the entire picture emerges. And what you just did is you use all this in pooled information through the internet that now we can just find within half an hour. And you come to the conclusion, hang on, if this is going on, MI5 must be running it. Yeah. And then when you reach to this stage, you go to the MI5 page, right? And here, this is the MI5 page, right? Keeping our country safe. Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and then, you know, you scroll down and you think, who is running this place? This is Mr. Andrew Parker. He graduated, I think, Churchill College, I think, in Cambridge. Okay. Oh, he graduated from Cambridge. We all know what that means. But anyway, here is Mr. Andrew Parker. Um, he's, I think he was already an intelligence agent when I was in my diapers. So this guy could be my dad, you know. So the question I have for Mr. Andrew Parker is, you know, so what's up, daddy? Not up for the job? You know, how come, how come you're not tired? Sure. Up? How come it's down to literally women and children to do the investigation and, and actually do real national security. What's going on? Well, <laughs> what he isn't allowed to say is that he's in deep capture by organized crime. He works for organized crime and so does MI6. And then suddenly it all becomes clear, you know, the invasion of Iraq, of Afghanistan, it all becomes clear. What did they get in Afghanistan? Well, the poppy farms, you know, um, you know, opium, uh, heroin, I think it gets refined in Pakistan, I heard, you know, so it's a big thing. And it's used by the pharma industry as well and painkillers, you know, all that sort of stuff. This is fused, it must be. And if you go back to this um, paper by the Swiss mathematicians about the, um, uh, what's it called, the network of global corporate control, why I said this shows the, the syndicate, the cartel, in terms of global companies, but there are two things it doesn't show. Number one, organized crime, which is also business, it's just that it's not taxed. And the second thing it doesn't show is governments, you know, and, and public institutions. So it's only the private sector, but the, the public sectors fit in, into that and organized crime as well. So what we're looking at is this massive octopus that by now owns all the banks and must own all of military intelligence and all of the militaries. And it must be run by psychopaths and organized crime. This must be the organized crime cartel we're looking at. And then suddenly it all becomes clear. Yes, of course, they invaded um, Afghanistan, got the opium, heroin refined in Pakistan, you know, to the pharma companies, the drug trade, and then going into Iraq, you know, the oil, yada, 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 you know, going into Syria for other business plans. And now we're coming to this stage of, you know, um, Oh, by the way, actually one clip I didn't play in the beginning that uh, Millicent wanted us to play is the um, speech by Eisenhower warning us of the military intelligence complex. You know, I, I don't want to um, play it now because we're running out of time, but I want to um, put the link maybe um, later on um, into, the, into the chat. So it's the 1961 speech by Eisenhower warning us um, of the military industrial complex. And um, that link... Um, We'll put it in. It's, it's very, very powerful. But that's exactly why, you know, because already in nineteen in the nineteen sixties, they felt that the military intelligence and the military industrial complex was behaving in a criminal way. It, they had they had to warn against it. If it hadn't been a criminal organization, it wouldn't have been a threat to the state. But that's why. But actually, now, actually, 
Do you think you might have a little time to be able to talk a bit? Okay. Actually, it's, I think, only two minutes long. So I've got it up on my screen. So let me just share my screen be again. Careful. Because you are right, it is. And actually, according to Kirk Wiebe, this is the very first time there was a public broadcast by a head of state. And that's what he, he used, the first ever public broadcast for the following message. So it's January 17, 1961. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. So that's it, right? Um, but it is a pretty um, powerful warning and um, you know everything that he said you know the the establishment of, of a private sector in this and these the sprawling private um, um, you know um, companies that's exactly what we're seeing you know that's exactly happened so it's, all, it's too late really it's like his was a warning from the past but we're now well beyond the point at which everything that he foresaw has come true you know, the disastrous yeah. rise of misplaced power, is what he said. Yes, in 61, we were way beyond the ability to get this under control. Uh, after that, actually, there used to be a rule, it was probably a law, that you couldn't profit from war in the United States. No company could profit from war, war profiteering. But then, you know, Standard Oil did during the Second World War. They were uh, selling a secret chemical to the Nazis. Uh, that would allow them to make their coal because they didn't have any oil resources. Their coal and oil, yeah, but Rockefeller was pulled up and uh, they were going to, uh, you know, censor him for that, but he got out of it because, of course, he runs the government. So it's been going on a long time, and uh, it's interesting that he would say that, being a member of the military-industrial complex itself. In the Constitution, it warns about a standing army. It prohibited a standing army. That's the reason that uh, uh, citizens of the United States are encouraged to be armed, because at any time they could be congealed into uh, an armed forces. But a standing military is, uh, is a real danger. You see, the way we characterize war now, it's a necessary uh, it's a necessary element of society. You have war, you fight. No, war is insanity. War is the failure of diplomacy. 
It's the failure of ability to get along with one another. And the whole notion of war is, is the whole problem here. Um, and I, I, don't know where you, I don't know where you'd go with that, but... Uh, well, you know, yes, if, I, you look, if you look at all of the military documents that have come out of NASA, that have come out of the U.S. Air Force, that have come out of the U.S. Army in the last 20 to 30 years, projecting the, the, the battle space, as they call it, in, um, in the future, which by the way, we are in now because those documents talk about this time period, 2015 to 2025. So when they look at this time period and you look at the language in which these documents are written, it is seriously disturbing because they are always looking ahead to a time period, or so they say, when there is increased disturbance on the ground, increased protest, increased civilian unrest, so you see, it's predictive programming. They are trying to project that this is what's going to happen, and therefore, they need to come in with their information warfare techniques, with their cyber warfare techniques, with the electronic warfare techniques and electronic weapons, those, you know, double speak items for a deadly barbaric lethal weapon to be used on civilians. But that's the language in which they're couching it. So in a sense, if you pull back and look at what they are doing, in relation to what you just talked about, Paul, what they are doing is they are trying to, in their documentation, continually attempt to rationalize and continually attempt to create a, me uh, a meaning and a reason for the continuance of the war ideologies over and over and over. And this is what they're kind of putting across to us, you know, and this is the double speak they're putting across to us. This is the language in which the military talks. And therefore, this is the language that the big government propaganda machine, the mainstream media, uses to present to us. So then it becomes part of that whole conglomerate of brainwashing and mind washing that is fed to young people, to anybody watching TV, anybody reading the newspaper. And, you know, couple that with what they are doing in terms of video games, movies, all of that in terms of mind washing and brainwashing. And you have this whole ideology of war continuing to be propagated generation to generation. It's absolutely vile. Well, they've created the situation that would, would cause any type of uh, discontent. I mean, you have George Soros creating a, a platform for uh, black people to hate white people, universities turning women against men. You have everybody, the whole pot being stirred. If you go back to the 50s, I mean, everybody was fat and happy. Of course, we had just, we had just come through a war. And uh, in the United States, we, of course, had annihilated all the competition. So we were fat and happy. But everybody was happy. And then in the, during the awakening in the, from the 60s to the 80s, we had um, um, of one sort or of another being fueled by the CIA. We had uh, mind control. We had Tavistock, we had the Aquarian uh, conspiracy, uh, and then we have major influence of TV on what you need, what you have, comparing you to everybody else. I mean, I think a good example is this TV series called Dallas, where everybody in the United States watched these incredibly rich people in Dallas solve their little social nitpicking problems. And so we've been schooled to be discontent. We've been schooled to be the enemy. And of course, when you create the enemy, then you've got to create this military industrial complex. And it's got to be secret because of course, the enemy's funding it. We're funding the, we're funding the controlled weapons that are being used against you guys. We're funding the research. We're funding all that because we're the discontent masses. Exactly. So and it's like the perfect, uh, Fire department, you know, they set the fire and then put it out. You know, it's, they're the perfect, it's the perfect defense department. Yeah, and now it's like, as, as Catherine was saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over what you were saying. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I talked over you, Ramallah. What were you saying? Oh, no, no I, as I was just going to corroborate what Catherine was saying earlier about the military industrial complex. It's now become a full scale industry. You know, I think there was an article recently in Activist Post talking about how it, over the past, uh, I, I don't know how many years, but there were like 1,800 movies and television shows that have been created in Hollywood to glorify war. 
you know, and to give everybody the impression that it's all about war, it's all about super soldiering. We need our soldiers to become really tough because we need to be, you know, the, the foremost power in the world. We need to defeat the bad guys. And who are the bad guys? They are Iraqi insurgents. They are Syrian insurgents, yeah. you know. And we, the U.S., the American soldiers, you know, Captain America is going to go out there and destroy all of them. And this is a good thing. And this is what we teach our children to do. Yeah, be American and so forth. Right. Um, so it's an industry. And, and, and that's it's exactly as you were saying. You have Soros on the one hand, funding in all the, funding all the protests stirring up the pot, so to speak, setting people against each other, sending whole masses of refugees into Europe to create problems in European countries so that they can turn against those countries where these people have come from, you know? And they're not real refugees, obviously. They're, they're created refugees. And I understand they are also paid refugees. A lot of young men yeah. paid to go in and create violence. Um, situations in Sweden and Germany and, and various countries in Europe. So you have that going on over there and you have the whole, you know, Black Lives Matter movement going on over here and the pitting of white against black, the pitting of heterosexuals against homosexuals, the LGBT movement suddenly. And, and you know, so everything, everything sort of combining in a sense to, um, to create an impression of unrest which is what they can then write up in their documentation and, and use as rationalization for greater need for homeland security, greater need for the military to work with the local police, and greater need for electronic weapons, you see. And oh, this also actually brings in the reasoning for the brain weapons. So what they're really mm -hmm. doing, the DIA and CIA, they're busy rolling out their secret experimentation programs on vast numbers of the populace, all of their social engineering programs. And some of this, I should say, is public domain. You can go up to the DARPA website and see some of their contracts and look at what they're doing. Um, and some of it is secret, and it's only targeted individuals who know what's going on. And, you know, some of the whistleblowers and scientists have written out and spoken out about it. Um, but what they're literally trying to do is influence humans. And imagine how they could influence us. They could influence us to accept violence to accept this constant cycle of violence, to accept the necessity for war, to accept all of the silly decisions that they come up with regarding how many bombs to drop on Syria or, or on Afghanistan and things like that. They, they are literally at a moment in time when they're in danger of being fully mentally take, taken over, being taken over um, through all of these methodologies of neuro warfare that are being applied against them. And it would be perfect for them, wouldn't it? Yeah. To, to run their industries nonstop, to run their mechanisms of war nonstop, and just dumb us all down and keep us all compliant and non-questioning, you know, non-critical thinking and so forth. Absolutely. And, and you know what, in all this, it's um, imagine, you know, um, when, when we just rotate out, because we have, as, as you um, so wonderfully put, we are all being brainwashed into a certain image of um, the military and military intelligence. And now they are doing it to us. So we always say, you know, the CIA or MI5 or BND, you know. By the way, I, I today I spoke about, and I'm going to sp speak some more about the British situation, but <clears throat> the German intelligence agency is just the same. And the Swiss intelligence agency is just the same. Um, and we are thinking about them as, as some sort of military defense organization, but actually we should think about them as running organized crime and then think, hang on, organized crime has now developed neuro weapons. Organized crime has developed weapons and, and machine guns that don't leave bullet holes. And suddenly you understand why I'm being machine gunned in my own home. Because if you think about the NDB and you think about Marco Seiler running a defense organization, it doesn't make any sense. But if he's running organized crime, well, it makes perfect sense. And then everything that they say, you realize, is, it, is, it, is a form of gangster talk. It's double speak. So when they say national security, that's gangster talk of cartel security. We, and therefore it follows that women like Ramola and I, we are a threat to cartel security because we keep going around saying the truth. Like as if we had a right to just, you know, blurt out the, 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 the flaming obvious. They don't think we've got a right because it is like, you know, it is like um, disrespecting the mafia boss. 
That's and right. you know what, but it's precisely what this that they are trying to stop. They are trying to stop everybody behaving like we are. Everybody yeah. just getting in front of the camera, speaking our minds, and really telling the truth. Telling the truth as it's obvious from even looking at their own military documents. So they really want to stop everybody around us from thinking, look, you, can't, you cannot do what she is doing because, do you know, we are actually hitting her with weapons to stop her. And, and they are. And actually, my neighborhood is perfectly aware because we are witness to the many planes and helicopters over my house all the time. They are the ones allowing these, you know, fusion center jokers to come and park in their driveways and point their cell phones and weapons at me. They are the ones opening up their living rooms and their basements and their side rooms and their attics to these guys who are coming in and sitting in their front doors, sitting in their front rooms and uh, working on tracking and hitting me. So the neighborhood is perfectly aware. The neighborhood is perfectly aware and the neighborhood has probably been told that, I, that I'm, uh, you know, a kingpin criminal here and I'm a terrorist and I'm a spy. And they've been told this by the group of criminals running the fusion centers running the local police departments and running the intelligence agencies. These are criminal operations being run to protect criminals. Yes. And I think that's the absolute truth. And they really don't want, you know, people like you and I speaking out and just sort of pointing very simply and very clearly to what, to the actual truth of what is happening. I don't think you, either of you, any of the techno crime fighters or any of the people that are speaking out of this realize what a danger you are to them how, how uh, terrified they must be. Uh, well, just like you two, very articulate. One's a journalist, one is an amazing scientist, able to delve into the structure of these organizations, let alone the structure of these energy weapons. You guys are so dangerous to them. Uh, I mean, to get a complete picture, yeah, they're big. Yeah, they're powerful. Yeah, they're all over the world. Yeah, they've been going for a thousand years, but they're terrified of you guys cover every time you come on, every time you speak truth, you're blowing their cover. And they don't seem to be able to get rid of the internet. They don't seem to be able to, they can damper down a YouTube and those things. Yeah, they're, but they need them for reconnaissance. So we've got, a, we've got an, an in, a way to speak. I think how dangerous you are to them. Getting this information out, I mean, when I saw Stop 007, yeah, I knew that they were a corrupt organization, but I thought perhaps they did something good. No, they don't. They're a criminal organization. It's a cartel. The intelligence organizations, the military organizations, they don't work on behalf of citizenry. And that information has to get out. It's, it shouldn't be a secret. Uh, it's, it's, it should be plain and simple. They run the child trafficking. They run organ uh, trafficking. They run uh, all the all the drugs. They they do all the uh, they do they set up all the wars. I mean, they're the bottom line. They're the evil element. And unless uh, the more we can tell the truth, the more we can say this, the more people that can wake up to this. And there are people who are waking up to this. Uh, the more powerful you are. That's what, that's why it's, it's not like us, uh, us civilian uh, women speaking out and trying to get ourselves uh, safe from these weapons. No, we're a dangerous threat to them. We are, we can tell truth and truth sounds different than lies. When you wake up from the mainstream media and you start awakening the truth just resonates differently i know we have a lot of trouble finding out who's a deceiver and who's not a deceiver in this little uh enclave that we have of ti's uh because certainly they have infiltrated that but the truth sounds different than lies and the truth is something that they they have no defense against all they can do is shut it down shut us up that's all they can do with it because they can't change. Yeah, and I think it's so important and because, um, you know, for me, the biggest question is, so we've got this organized crime cartel and we now face up to the fact that these are organized crime outfits. Um, and then one thing that we haven't really um, 
talked about very much is also the, the I mean, in the beginning a bit, the role of secret societies. But for secret societies, the same holds as for military intelligence. If it's that secret, it will be indeed captured by organized crime. So it is actually a given. Actually, here's a book. Uh, I've got it here. So it is a given that, um, you know, secret organizations have been already deep captured by organized crime, otherwise known as the mafia. I mean, we talked about, you know, how it all goes back to Rome, all the road, roads lead back to Rome. And it's very curious because I, um, this is in German, this is a book here in German, and it's a history book. Um, it is the secret diaries of the Duke uh, of, uh, and then I'm in real trouble because I don't know, it's, it's like, it's spelled C-R-O, and then there's a Y with a double dot on. And I, I don't know how you pronounce that in French. You know, Ramola, do you know C-R-O-Y double dot on top? It's one of these aristocratic quirks, you know, like Motorhead puts a double dot on the one of the O's, you know, or the, the, the O on, um, to actually appear like... Is it Kua? Croix. Yeah, maybe. Croix. Croix, yes, exactly. So it's the Duke of Croix, you know. Yes, but he lived, you know, yeah. from 1718 and was clearly quite poncy given that he made this aristocratic quirk with his name, but 1780 to 1784. And I have to look up which chapter it is, but it's this one chapter where he uh, goes and he attends and he writes into his diary about attending um, a meeting of the Freemasons. And he goes there and he's just so, he thinks it's really cool. He goes and he meets all these other princes and dukes and they're all hanging out, being cool. You know, it's an all males club, like it still is. And then he goes back, you know, in, in, in his diary, he writes the code, you know, their code. And that diary entry is all half in code. And, you know, you kind of can tell what he's saying. But then, you know, their rituals, it's all abbreviations and fanciness. And you just think, hang on, you know, mate, did it? Did it ever occur to you to think, hang on, I'm a duke, I'm going to this secret meeting. Could it be that some really shrewd businessmen and criminals want to get at my money? It doesn't occur to this old guy. Not at all. It's so cool because it's secret. And, you know, all these princes and, hey, you know, he's down with them. And like, oh, gee, that's 18th century people. That shit was going on in the 18th century. Now, the question is, what are the Freemasons? What is this? And you can just use simple systems analysis to say, well, it's a front of the mafia. It has to be. It has to have been infiltrated by the biggest organized crime ring, the global organized crime network run by the church. And then it suddenly makes all sense because, hey, there's this sort of organization that starts, that tries to schmooze with royalty. Yes. What could they possibly want? I think it's their money. And now, this is, remember, this is 1718, okay, 1718. So that's like, um, you know, I mean, something like 400 years ago, almost, you know, 400 years ago. And that's when the Freemasons were putting on networking events for royals, you know, all really secret. And then there's also just like, oh, gosh, there's an, another YouTube video of a, of a lawyer, an American lawyer, talking about the rituals of the Freemasons. And it's just like, oh, God. I mean, you can tell why it's an all-male club, because most women would just roll around laughing under the table doing this nonsense. But you can actually get men to do this crap, you know? I, I'm, frankly, I think you can get women to do similar crap. You know, I should be fair to men. Yeah, that's probably true. But, you know, it's interesting that these are mainly male organizations, and they've come down through time, and they really talk about, you know, the same thing as the good old boys network these guys all get together and think they're doing something great sitting around smoking cigars and doing god knows what else um you know thinking they're all in some kind of very special secret organization and they're hobnobbing hobnobbing with kings and queens yeah hobnobbing with a strong emphasis on the second syllable i would say <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. well, there's the eastern star which is the female version of the mason and then of course down through the years there's always been witches covens who've been mostly women, uh, the Dionysus cult, which, uh, you know, corrupted uh, societies down through the years has always been mostly women. So, you know, I, I think it's unfair to, to blame I, it on men uh, totally. I mean, uh, certainly war is uh, something that's always attributed to men. But, uh, you're absolutely right, Paul. Yeah. 
pedophiles that are women. Yes, they are. They are. I think they so. are. But I would suggest that you know it's mainly men who started these organizations, and maybe women had you know organizations after that, or they were roped in a little bit after that. I would suggest that these are really patriarchal institutions. I would say so, and I would think awesome. that I've, mm -hmm. I, I think I've I've heard of you know um, you know there's these like yeah, I think it's even in Britain, and I think maybe Seven talks about it of you know people being women being anointed as you know queen of the witches. I'm like really, ladies, if you're okay. certain because says queen of the witches, I think that was a spell. At this point in time, there appears to be some kind of egalitarianism, as you note, Paul. At this point in time, it's anything goes. Women are you know being roped in and happy to be to jump in apparently. You know, and a lot of the women I see driving the cars and the SUVs directly at me and all the hazardous driving, the, the drivers are women, okay? Yeah. And young women, middle-aged women, older women, young moms, young girls, yeah. and of course young boys as well, are all being roped into this. I think there's a big division between men and women now. It's really pushed through the universities, social justice warriors, especially white males. They're, they're to blame for everything that's ever been evil, evil that's happened in the world. Now, since uh, Adam Weisskopf and uh, the creation of the Masons, yeah, they've been the, they've been the front, they've been the, the ones. Actually, you could go back to uh, Sebastian Savi and the uh, Synagogue of Satan. That was, that was pretty much male, too. So, uh, yeah, and I yeah, think we, we, we have a, we've had a patriarchy for a long, long time. And uh, we have to deal with the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, maybe it'll change into a matriarchy. Maybe, maybe the balance of the sexes will come back. Maybe that's one of the maladies that this whole crisis is trying to uh, rebalance. Well, yes, but, oh, uh, and the people running the corporations and us are trying to avert the, the power of the female voice. And I think part of what's happening right now is women have had it. Women have had it all around the world, and you will see in every field of action and activism, you will hear and see women speaking out. And, you know, we are talking about indigenous women, women at the yeah. tribal level, women at the village level, and women at the county and city and state level as well. You know, women who are educated as we are, who are speaking out, and also women who, who have to walk three miles to get water to, to, for, their, for their families, you know, in Africa and in India and so forth. So I, I really think we are coming into a time period, Paul, where women are beginning to speak out in very strong ways, in ways that cannot be completely ignored. And if at all we have any power today as women speaking out, perhaps it's that, you know, perhaps it's because women are not going to hold back. We are going to, as you say, speak the truth. And the well, truth you know, has I, a particular I, I flavor love, to it. I would love to see that happen. But in Sweden, you have women saying, I'd rather be raped than racist. They're, they've been so corrupted by the social justice causes and the liberal meme. And then, of course, you have the whole uh, religion of Islam, where women are, well, you know, they're child bearers, basically, in that, in that culture. They still do. Uh, yeah, um, I, th I think it's um, relation there. So, so I, I hope that that's true, Romola. I really hope that that's true. But I think it's probably up to women in the countries that are uh, in the Western countries like the United States and Europe to stand up and do something about it because women in other countries are so subjugated that they, you know, they're depending on you. It's, you I, know, I, I don't know. Go ahead, go ahead. But I, I would have a few things to say about that. Just a couple things. The, the whole thing about it's mostly made, mostly made up of people who really just attend to their day-to-day -day survival. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people in the world are, are like that. I mean, we're, the three of us, are very lucky because we've had educations, we've had, uh, we, we are, we're exposed to a lot of different things. And so for if anybody's going to stop this, this this insanity, it's going to be us, men and women. And if, and if women are going to do uh, a major role in it, it's, so be it. That would, that would be wonderful. Uh, but there's only a few of us who are going to be able to see the problem here. Well, I, you, you understand? yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. And I do think there is a great advantage, obviously, that we have, thanks to our education and our privilege and, you know, the class into which we, each of us has been born into. 
so that we've had access to this education and we're able to be articulate and able to speak out. So uh, there is a very good point to be made there. Absolutely, I do agree with you. Um, but in terms of that Swedish woman or whoever said it, I'd rather be raped than racist or, um, you know, that I would, I would suggest is part of the contrived narrative. It's part of the Soros funded narrative that is being pushed onto the rest of us. You know, look at these well, poor there's Swedish no women. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they, they're not saying that because they weren't culturally mind controlled into that position. Yes, I see what you're saying, that, that you know, that the whole progressive social justice mem is all about being politically correct and about uh, never being, uh, never even projecting the possibility of, of uh, racism by saying, oh, you know, this guy who came here as a refugee from Tunisia or wherever from some part of Africa has been uh, raping women in our community and therefore this uh, community of guys who are running this should be condemned. So these guys, so these women are afraid to say that. So that could very well be a thing, you know, could very well be true that that is happening. And the people in Sweden, just as much as the people in America and the women in America and all of us who are educated through the university system are also trained not to speak in those terms, you know, not to project one person to a larger community, never to be, to give the, the impression of being racist in any way always to attempt to be very careful in our speech and be politically correct and so forth. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's, hamstringing, that's hamstringing all of us. Yes. That's hamstringing not only women, but all of us to, to, say, to, to saying truthful things. Uh, there's a different level IQ for uh, different races in the, in the United States, but you don't dare say that mm -hmm. because that would be racist. Well, it's truth. And the political correct veneer is holding us down, is what I'm saying. Yes, the politically correct the veneer one... keeps us from examining the real truth, and we'll never know what the real truth is unless we actually devote ourselves scientifically to understanding what that is. Yes, you're right. And even the whole movement toward hate, hate speech in this country keeps people from right. saying things that, that may be true, but that are now being covered under hate speech and so forth. Um, the one point I wanted to make was when you said women from other parts of the world. Um, I do think women from other parts of the world actually are, um, are speaking out. I mean, I grew up in India. So I, I'm the product of an Indian education right up to the postgraduate level. You know, I did my MBA in India before I came to the United States, where I did a second master's in creative writing. So I lived, I have lived, you know, nonstop in India for a long period of time. And then, of course, I've gone back on and off for years. And I have cousins and friends and, you know, family in India. So I'm aware of what the education system is like in India. And I'm aware of the power of the women in India, who no doubt in many ways are still being traditionally subjugated in the kind of ways that you mentioned. But there are also women like me who are outspoken and articulate and working in different ways, you know, whether it's the social work realm or human rights or science, they're all working and speaking out, I believe. Um, the one thing I wanted to say though, is that when you say that um, most people just go to work, they were on that rat race, they were on that grind, that system, I would say is a patriarchal system. And that's something that everyone around the world um, has been roped into, you know, so that system, of uh, where it used to be just men being going off to work for eight hours a day, and now it's both men and women. So the mother and father both go off to work, and the child is separate and goes off to school, right? And so at this point in time, I think we begin to see how even that becomes an opportunity to take children and brainwash them very young within the common core system in the US and so forth, you know? And um, so to so all of these um, scenarios and situations that we've been faced with over time, I think I would say are patriarchal systems. And I feel that today women are coming into their own and beginning to speak out against every single system on the planet, every single system. Um, so including, um, you know, including um, just this basic system of going to work for eight hours a day, five days a week, you know? So right, right. Yeah, the one thing, one thing we have to, there's a thing called critical theory that came out of the Frankfurt School. It's really wrecked society. And it's not a theory. And it's, uh, it's just critical of everything. 
he says that if it exists, it has to be wrong and you have to rip it up. You have to throw it away. Um, that is, it, that permeates everybody's discussion all the time now. There are some good things about our society. There are some things, there, there are moral standards. Uh, we used to have a court system that was more or less, um, more or less fair. Uh, so when you're, when you're, women are militating against everything, you have to not throw the baby out with the bathwater on that one because uh, that's what critical theory really wants you to do. Critical theory, you should look it up. Critical theory says that if it exists, it's wrong. Uh, men and women, well, there's no men and women. A, a myriad of genders and it's, and it's fluid. So, so men and women really, even though it's scientific and biological, really doesn't exist. There's a, there's a fluidity in and out of the sexes. So it, it attempts to take part, take apart even something as basic as that. Feminism was created, according to Aaron Rousseau, who was told this by the Rockefellers, number one, to increase the tax, the tax base, doubles the tax base, and two, to get the children away from the parents at an earlier and earlier age. So feminism, in its newer reincarnations, it, the, even in that incarnation, it helped destroy the family. But it's in its newer system, it even destroys the family even further. Now, I think the family structure is very relevant and important and has basically gotten us this far. Now, the, the position of the male and the female, could it be readjusted? Is it wrong for the male to be the one that's working? And it, I mean, those things can be examined, but, the, but to throw out the family, which is what critical theory did, uh, I think was throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You see where I'm coming from in terms of uh, ripping yes, it? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, I understand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the you're right, and it, it, right now it does appear like the family is under attack, and um, you know the, those historic aspects about feminism. Um, um, too. I think there there's many different um, in terms of feminism. I guess we could talk quite a lot about that. But you know, one aspect about feminism, just equal rights for women, I think it's something that we would all agree with, right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I think that that is the aspect of feminism. I think that um, that I would, for instance, stand very strongly behind. Um, but I guess in talking in terms of a different paradigm of thinking, a different way of thinking, that's not that's not against men, but it's against patriarchal systems that stifle both men and women. And I think the eight hours a day, five days a week system stifles everybody. You know. And I would, and I, the kind of freedoms I'm envisioning for women are also the freedoms I would envision for men, where we would have a different way of working that would be more related to who we are as beings and take, uh, allow that's, us to exist as creative humans. It's abso that's today absolutely today. beautiful. That's absolutely yeah. beautiful, Ramola. I think that's where this has to go in terms of uh, why are they attacking us? What are they doing? This patriarchal, mm -hmm. uh, archical criminal war system, it really has to go. Yes. And I, I really applaud women uh, standing up for, for women and men because honestly, this system victimized, I can, I can remember my grandfather when he came over from the old country, he worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I mean, it was just, he was it's just all work. Um, yeah. here to work. They just sent him back if he uh, if he stopped. So we're all under the pressure. Also, you know, uh, mm -hmm. men have to get up and go into the military. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I was a young man, there was a there was a thing called the draft, which is where they would just uh, call on you, and you're you're in Vietnam, and uh, you know that's. Uh, Women didn't have that then. Apparently, women are going to have it if it comes back. But uh, 
So, so it's we're all victimized by this criminal system. Correct. This exactly. System. Neck, yeah. Exactly. And I think women are these days are just, we just had it. We, we're just sick and tired of this patriarchal system, of this whole bunch of patriarchal systems that we're all equally victimized by. And we're beginning to speak out. I think we're just sick and tired of it, you know? And I'm sorry, Catherine, I don't mean to go on and on. I know you're trying to say something. Jump in, please. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Sorry, um, I, I was entirely listening. I was just setting up a couple of links that I wanted to show, but I was listening. And um, everything that you said, I think, is, you know, I've, it, it was beautiful the way you said it, so that I wouldn't have wanted to interrupt. I think you're, you are all absolutely right. The thoughts I had is I, what I did in the background is setting up some links I wanted to share next. Um, but um, my, I just had a couple of thoughts. Number one, I agree with Ramola that um, this entire, um, you know, that was put out by the media, we have to remember. I would rather be raped than be a racist. You know, that, that's a slogan. I mean, no woman would say that. It's like, really? I mean, I don't, I'm not a racist if I say raping, no thank you, you know? <laughs> so I think normal women would think differently. The other thing is also, um, I have read um, people doing studies about, oh, um, you know, different races have different IQs. I want, to, I want to say something very important as a scientist about that, and that goes to the heart of IQ tests. I do not take IQ tests seriously at all because of the methodology. So it has been shown, for example, that um, people who are of average ability but do puzzles obsessively for years actually rate really high because they have a certain pattern of thinking. They have played through all the different things that people come up with and then can they actually score very, very high on these IQ tests, you know, just because they have done puzzles and know what sort of little games people play. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, so, you know, you can train yourself up with a lot of training to be actually quite good, but your IQ stays the same. Second of all, mm, IQ tests in themselves are, you know, it's like everything in science or in any sort of measurement, you know, it's like at first it kind of makes sense, but when you start thinking about it, you start, start seeing its shortcomings. And um, I remember that there was some IQ tests that, you know, I, that was weirdly done in primary school, at, in, in my primary school in Germany. Why, looking back, that's really, really, really strange, you know, um, very, very strange. I think it was in year four or something like that. So imagine you're, you're roped into an IQ test. But that was absolutely a bizarre exercise. But I remember thinking at the time, and now even more so, that what it ultimately comes down to when you really understand what this is, is actually second guessing what sort of pattern somebody expects you to find. Because typically in these IQ tests, as, as at least in the way I remember them, you know, there were different little tests and sometimes you see patterns and then they say, okay, what's the fourth one? So you see three patterns or three images and you have to complete the fourth. Well, in mathematics, it's like having, you know, three um, little um, parameters or you have, you know, a little, a little function that's mapping out a trend and then you have to say, what is the pattern? What's the trend? But the point is that if you've got three data points with maybe some sort of curve between them showing a trend, well, uh, you know, depending on how sophisticated you are, there's an infinite number of, of patterns that it can go on to. So in terms of these IQ tests, this very much depends on what pattern are you talking about? You know, you can say, okay, yes, this dot is jumping from one corner to the next. Therefore, in the fourth image, it has to go into the fourth corner. Yes, in the simple image. But when it gets very sophisticated, it, you say, well, okay, there could be overlay, you know, prime number calculations or some other pattern. And then it comes down to what level of sophistication of IQ test do you overlay to complete the pattern? And mathematically, there's an infinite number of possibilities. So out of those, you have to pick the one that the person who set the test expects you to get you know and that's the name of the game so iq tests are total and utter rubbish when you think about it you know and sometimes when you do iq tests i remember in the test i took when i was a kid you know uh sometimes i could have sworn the same patterns kept reappearing at later stages and it said oh it's going to get more and more difficult so i was thinking okay this time they want another pattern so you go one level up and then you make little games of what could be the pattern so at some point it's just an exercise in second second guessing the intelligence of the person who set the test and wrote the score you know exactly and i'm glad you talked about the patterns and how those trends could go anywhere and so because that sort of solidifies exactly what's the problem with iq tests because everybody i mean anybody who's taken an iq test knows how very um 
I don't know, monolithic they are perhaps. They don't really, you know, tap into all of the parts of our brain. They just tap into one little aspect of knowledge that we might have. Exactly. So, you know what, I, I wouldn't really go for um, distinguishing. Yes. And I and I, I think that whole issue of IQ t t tests and races is, is so charged. And you know, and I know, all of us have met people from every possible different ethnicity on the planet. And I don't think any of us would say, having interacted with people of different ethnicities, that there is even a possibility that, you know, IQs of different ethnicities could actually be charted along a curve. Absolutely. And I'm um, sorry, I just realized that um, Paul has left. I know, I just noticed that too. <laughs> and he's, uh, actually, I, I wanted to ask him if I may overrun because we were talking, it's like it's such a beautiful episode actually talking about criminality and all that because um, going back to the original thing, um, when we strip it all off from, you know, as we just said, the propaganda and trying to smear different races and so on, when we when we strip it down to its, bo uh, its, uh, its bare basics, the question is, OK, we have this organized crime cartel at the heart of our societies. And now the question is, what does it want, especially when we when it's attacking us? And I think you made a very, very good um, you know, description of how it's really going after us and going at, after our nature and so on and is attacking women at its core, trying to break up the family. Because, of course, when you've got broken up families, you've got children to, you know, that can be um, fed off into um, child services, into the pedophile services. Uh, single women who have to kind of watch out for their own income. You can use them for human trafficking, run them as prostitutes, and so on and so on. So you create, you're, you're a market maker when you're doing this sort of stuff. And now it's um, very much down to, if you if you wanted to guess what this organized crime cartel wants, that's also running our militaries and our military intelligence. You know, how can we um, get at it? And um, number one is trying to map out what maybe military intelligence is doing. And yes, we know what they are doing. They're shooting at us, right? Um, and then actually on this topic, and now that we, we are talking about the military, um, before I go on about the plans of organized crime, I think what's really important is actually having a good look at who is actually heading intelligence, you know? And um, I've just realized in the background, because today I wanted to focus on the British situation, I've just brought up the heads of British intelligence and they're going to say, oh my God, she's going on, you know, again, it's so unfair. Why always us? You know, oh, I no, just throw the rest of them in the mix. I mean, look at who's yeah. heading American intelligence for that matter. You know, all of them, yeah. they're all in the same pot together. They yeah. act exactly like each other. They're a bunch of Freemasons holding yeah. hands yeah. under the table yeah. and doing their little dances at night and killing exactly. children, right? Exactly. Oh, and the God. Freemasonry is going to come into it big time. But what's um, also really, really um, interesting is actually, um, so, and, and you know, the, the heads, I mean, for example, German intelligence after the Gestapo, it was refounded just nine years after the war. With the Gestapo, you, they should have stamped it out. But of course, the entire war was staged and then they, okay, they went quiet for nine years. But the Gestapo continued, you know, like before, the entire war was staged. So that's why we can understand how it came that the Gestapo was reopened officially just nine years after the this this horrific war. You know, that's why. And it was reopened under the name of the, the BND, so Bundesnachrichtendienst. Um, what does that stand for? Do you know the German translation? 